not at the extremes. Let's talk a little of the, a, a bit about the autocratic leaders in those countries where democracy is not a tradition. Because I think two separate things, right? This populism in countries with a democratic tradition, one thing, without a democratic tradition, something else. Masha, there is this sense that um, autocrats, the true autocrats, uh, peddle this fantasy that they have this strong, unequivocal, decisive leadership, and there's something resonating in that strong leadership, maybe on both sides, democracies and not. Um, why is that? It seems that that's so seductive right now. You talk about agency, that people want to give up some of their agency. Can you share a bit, like, why is it so seductive? Why do people in Russia love Putin? Well, actually, uh, we don't know if they love Putin. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> in those country, elections. In a country with right. no public and no right. opinion, you can't measure public opinion, right? right? Uh, in a country where the president totally controls the media uh, and has eliminated the public sphere as such, you can't, we can't actually know what people are thinking. Um, but uh, I, I want to very quickly the, uh, answer to the, the previous question, um, which is, you know, I live in the United States, so uh, I think that what is often called the extreme left in the United States, would be called the moderate right in most co normal countries of the world. So uh, I, 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 I kind of, uh, you know, from my point of view, um, there's, in, in that question, there's more of a false equivalency than there is uh, of, of an actual issue, right? Um, but um, as for autocrats and their appeal, um, the, the great social psychologist Eric Fromm wrote a book called Escape from Freedom. I highly recommend it. It's a very slim book. It's extremely readable. And I think it's amazingly illuminating. Uh, in the introduction to the book, he actually apologizes for writing it so hastily. Um, he says it's a little sloppy because he was in a hurry because he felt that the world is on the verge of catastrophe. The, that introduction is written in 1940. Right? Uh, but in the book, uh, he proposes that there are certain times uh, in in human history when people, um, there are two kinds of freedom. There's freedom from and freedom to. Freedom from is we all want our parents to stop telling us what to do. We all want the freedom from. Freedom to is the freedom to act, the freedom to invent your future. And it's a grave responsibility. And sometimes it gets to be too much. And when the future is truly uncertain, when people feel destabilized, when a critical mass of people feel like they don't know what's going to happen, um, then they will reach for what he calls the magic helper. The magic helper who is the populist leader who traffics in the appeal of the imaginary past and who says, okay, you can give over your agency, you can relieve yourself of this unbearable burden of freedom and I'll tell you what to do. And I think that appeal is universal right? yeah. uh, for people who feel like they don't know what their future is. I think that the difference between countries with a tradition of democracy and countries without it is what can be done with it. Right. Right. And how and what we can also do to oppose this this appeal of the imaginary past. And I think that creating a vision of the future and creating a vision of the future that, that is created, you know, in the commons that is created by people together, which is what politics really is, you know, that's something that countries with a tradition of democracy are in a position to do. Can I just build yeah, on what Moshe said, Heather said, okay? So I, I think uh, those are excellent points, Masha, and I would just like to build on your uncertainty point because I really believe uh, that particularly in sort of the industrialized West, this concern about the future and sense of uncertainty about the future, particularly when it comes to the economy, um, is extremely powerful. And it's real. Um, it's not sort of a, a fake concern. People are worried because there's something to worry about. I was recently talking with uh, the CEO of a big Canadian transport company, and I won't name him because I didn't tell him that I would mention his story today. Um, and he was talking to me about how they have a big shortage of truck drivers. And the reason they have a shortage of truck drivers is no one wants to train to be a truck driver now because people see automation coming. So imagine if you're my age, I turned 50 this summer, and you're, yeah, it was okay, I survived. Um, imagine if you're my age and you're a truck driver. Um, my uncle was a truck driver. And you know, you're a truck driver and you see this wave of automation coming. And 
you think to yourself, like, will my job last long enough for me to retire? That, that is not some kind of amorphous anxiety. That is very real economic anxiety. And I think in a lot of Western industrialized democracies, that anxiety has come on top of very real lived failure of capitalist democracy, right? It has come on top of the 2008 financial crisis. It has come on top of median wage stagnation for decades. And so I think that there is, you know, nothing that mysterious about people saying, you know what? This system, which was supposed to deliver security for me, opportunities for my children, one, hasn't been doing such a great job for the past 20 years, and two, doesn't seem to have a plan for how the next 20 or 30 well, years this is Well, this could be a discussion for an entire day, really, the extent to which um, the capitalist system has not delivered or has warped certain things, or the division of wealth, the, the, the crazy amount of wealth at the top, and what the capitalist system has done, which is good, and I must say, it worries me, these kinds of um, discussions that don't get enough exposure, that is, I would like to see them have more exposure, because I think people could jump to conclusions, and it gets me to my next question, uh, based on some research I saw, um, and you didn't even get to answer the second part, and I knew 30 minutes wasn't going to be enough here. Um, but I was reading some research recently that millennials, uh, a bigger number of people in that cohort than ever, are questioning whether or not um, democracy and the capitalist system that underpins it is of value. And even if that's only 15 or 18 percent of the people, that's a lot of people. So you're clearly right, but there's a whole lot to excavate there. I mean, right. If like, for example, why the question is posed that way? Why, why right. we're ha having democ uh, dem uh, why we have linked democracy and capitalism as though they're inextricable? Well, aren't they? No, aren't they? No. Okay. Well, that's that's. <laughs> um, I'm I'm open to learning, which I think is why we're all here. But I would say, um, I would say that the. Uh, everything that I have read, learned so far, which is clearly not as much as you have, but that would be an interesting debate, whether or not uh, capitalism, so it isn't succeeding the way it should, um, but has it caused boats to rise more over the last period of time? But that's bigger than we have a discussion for today, but it would be such a rich discussion, and I'm sure I could learn a ton and hopefully add something to the discussion. But I want to get to two uh, other questions before we're over. Um, the immigration issue, which is so significant and which feels so much like it needs to be addressed, and the the more tyrannical leaders, in, whether in democratic countries or not, seem the most unlikely to embrace, understand, have empathy for those who have become immigrants, often fleeing the most ridiculous circumstances. You've been incredible. Can you each comment a little bit? I'm, we're left with two minutes and I've got a thousand, but would you each comment on just your, your thoughts on how are we going to address this immigrant uh, legitimate opportunity with the current leadership in so many countries. Okay, I'll, I'll say two points really quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, I just want to start, and it does have an immigrant connection, Heather, with this economic point we were making. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I want to be clear, like, I think a market economy is the best way people have figured out how to run economies so far. Uh, but I think that if we are worried, and I think we should be, about liberal democracy, we have to be really worried about how people in the middle class and people working hard of in the course. middle class fare. And if we don't address and that bottom. very legitimate economic insecurity, all our other values are going to be in jeopardy. And I think it is very much connected with the anti-immigrant sentiment we're seeing in a lot of places. Because I think when people feel insecure about their lives, uh, it goes back to Masha's point about looking for magical solutions, looking for magical leaders, and looking for magical enemies. And it's always easiest to blame the other. It's easiest to blame the other country. It's easiest to blame the 
person who has just arrived. And, you know, I obviously think that's not right. And, you know, knock on wood, uh, we seem in Canada still to have a strong public consensus around the value to our country of being welcoming to immigrants. And I, yeah, it's great, isn't it? I want to. And I, I, Chris, I'll, I I'll say one sentence. Why they're super Matt fast? Can I just one say one sentence really on fast? I, okay. I, and so, why is that a good thing? One. For me, it's consistent with my values. I love living in our super diverse city of Toronto. You may not know, Masha, 50% of the people in Toronto are born outside Canada. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Um, but it's also a huge competitive advantage for our country. We are going to be a country which can continue to grow, can continue to thrive, partly because we remain an open society. And I think that's great. Just, and I agree with you, by the way, that we need to deal with not just the middle, but the bottom, but go, go. <laughs> so very, very quickly, uh, I'm just going to skip the problem and go immediately to the solution. Right. Uh, I think we have to stop uh, uh, allowing ourselves to, get, uh, to be, uh, to, we, we, stop, uh, we have to stop allowing hate to frame uh, the immigration debate, which we in the United States yeah. are really stuck in. And we, and the counter argument has to be much bigger than the immigrants are good for the economy or immigrants are good people. The counter argument has to be based on non-immigrants being good people. We have to be open. Uh, we, we have to, uh, to, to have our country open to other people, not because they are good, but because we are good. Because that is a basic That's attribute right. of humanity. So, That's excellent. Uh, I have to say, we couldn't have be we couldn't end on on a note that is um, more joyous because this is at its core, isn't it, about our basic humanity and our empathy and our ability to approach life that way. Thank you both so 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 much, Chris, especially in the midst of what you're in, you. Masha. You have to come back to Canada because Absolutely. this is an audience and a country. I think that really wants to learn from you. And thank, thank you, you Heather. So Great job. Okay.